most of all, thank our guest, James Neway, for coming to join us. Um, as you have seen from his bio, uh, James has done uh, quite a number of things in his career to date. Uh, he's chief counsel of the New Economics Foundation. Uh, he spent almost 20 years as a shadow chancellor as economic advisor in Nigeria this year. Uh, his PhD is from SOAS, the from my school of law. School of law. School of law. Excuse me. And um, he just completed a book, which uh, is due very shortly, uh, will be published, uh, yes, sometime later this year. Or uh, good. So, James uh, is going to give us a sort of overview of how he thinks uh, Labour Party policy is evolving and what it might mean in government. Um, we can open up to, to, to the floor, which raises a lot of issues around uh, uh, exchange rates and Brexit, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, people will have an interest in. Uh, but we'll leave that to the Q&A, which will be all for that one. Um, the discussion now is uh, in our way. So, James, welcome. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invite to, to say a few words. I just wanted to sort of lay out and outline um, Labour's economic programme. I think one of the things we've suffered from since, uh, well, I mean, started working with John in October 2015, so at least since that, is, is a degree of, what do you call it, almost, I don't want to say fake news, but misinformation. Uh, about what Labour is up to and what we plan to do and that sort of thing. And, and it's been quite dire when you, you, know, you go to meet people in the city who've got hold of some sort of called bit of analysis from one of the city firms, which is basically a sort of close copy of a, an editorial in the Daily Telegraph, you know, that kind of thing. It's not necessarily very healthy, it's not where we want to get to. As John has always stressed that the only way this works is with, agree, with, with, with transparency and openness. There is no point. Uh, was trying to say, yes, we want to be a radical and transformative government. Uh, yes, we want to do these things. But they don't have some secret plan to do it. We have to be completely open, completely clear about what we're doing. And that's the only way uh, any of this will work. So in that spirit, I wanted to try and lay out um, where we've got to on, on economic policy. I should say, I mean, obviously it says of a, a former economic advisor, which, which means it's sort of you know, kind of off the leash. I can say where it pops into my head. But just to be clear, this is me speaking as my personal opinion rather than please don't believe it's necessarily as the way parties um, corporate sort of view of the world. Uh, and if people ask questions, I'm happy to give my personal opinion and overview of that. But again, don't necessarily take this as like speaking with the authority of the party itself or whatever you, you might think of that. Um, so with that proviso, there's, there's a couple of things. Like I said, uh, the next economic program does plan to be uh, radically transformative. The phrase that John used was to create a society that's uh, radically fair and more democratic and uh, more sustainable than more before. The issue that we face, the big sets of issues that we face in the British economy, I think, are, are fairly clear. Uh, even leaving aside Brexit, they have been clear for a number of years that we've had now, I think, crippling austerity since 2010. Uh, the social consequences of this, if anybody visits London or really any big city, you can see the social consequences of shocking rise in, in homelessness. So, over the last few years, perhaps the most visible aspect of that. Um, the usual estimate, or the estimate recently, the British Medical Journal is it's responsible for 130,000 uh, excess deaths over the last few years. So, the social consequences of austerity uh, are pronounced. There are notable uh, economic consequences, more um, directly economic consequences, which I think have now fed through quite clearly in the last few years. It's been a contributor, uh, certainly over time, to the uh, stagnation in real wages. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, you have to go back a very long period of time, you know, to the Napoleonic Wars, to find a period in which real wages have either fallen or at least not risen for as long as they have done over the last few years or so. So real wages, uh, Africa, Average real wages are lower uh, today than they were in 2010. It's an incredible period of, of decline and stagnation in most people's living standards. Uh, related to that is the decline and stagnation in productivity, uh, specialization and output per hour, that we have converted quite notably over the last sort of eight years or so uh, into an economy that is dependent on basically a low rate of investment producing low productivity jobs, which you pay low wages, which you have few protections. So this is a labour market that's become skewed in a, in a very, very specific way over time. If we factor into that a couple of big emerging issues, um, one of which is raised, which I'll talk about briefly, but we can take questions and have a discussion on that, I think, mostly in, in the Q&A section. The two big issues are striking, I think, the effects of climate change, which are now becoming apparent, uh, have been apparent really for, for a long period of time to, to scientific opinion. I think they're now becoming apparent to popular opinion. If you look at just the, the opinion poll of this and you ask people what are your top three concerns uh, about the state of the country today, the shift 
in environment from being about number 20 to being about number three uh, over the last few months has been very, very striking, and I expect that situation to continue, that climate change and the environment will be the proverbial, or one of the proverbial Dorset issues uh, whenever the next election occurs. Uh, speaking personally, I strongly suspect that the next election will not be happening before 2022. Um, that given the Fixed Term Parliament Act removes most of the ways in which government can be easily forced from office, and it doesn't want to be forced from office, given the few incentives for a government to want to leave office at this point in time, 2022 remains the most likely date for the next election, I would say. Now, that doesn't mean you won't end up with one earlier, that whoever takes over as Conservative leader, depressingly, is probably going to be Boris Johnson, um, barring them toward. Whoever takes over may decide to do, do a sort of Theresa May uh, and force a vote through Parliament and therefore rely on Labour because we would vote for an early general election, of course, in terms of the state of policy. Um, vote for an early general election, potentially for one in October, uh, either before, around, or just after Brexit, or basically deliver Brexit in some form. That, that's a, a possibility. But given what happened in 2017, um, I, I think you know, there will be solid arguments on the Conservative side to not go through that again. I strongly suspect if I was any contender for the leadership work the race, I wouldn't do this publicly, but I send quietly to MPs that I'm definitely not going to call an early general election. Uh, would be one of the things you could be whispering in people's ears or making sure people know about. So 2022 is probably a time frame um, we're looking at on that one. Which means that there's a degree of time in which we're, we're having established, if you like, the baseline of the 2017 manifesto, the baseline in particular of the kind of economic policy we want to see and we want to develop um, over the next few years. It's a question of moving on from that and dealing with some of the challenges that, that perhaps weren't quite so prominent uh, as past that manifesto. I don't envisage that the next manifesto will vary that much from the 2017, um, what, what we've got from 2017. I think that's it's, it's proved to be, and uh, people might uh, remember the story about it being leaked in draft form some time before it was due to be published, which had the uh, unexpected certainly for the people leaking it, which you know, wasn't us, but it would have been a nice Machiavellian thing to do. Um, had the unexpected impact of proving to be a very, very popular document. That a sort of solid, recognisably European social democratic offer was something that proved to be very, very popular with a great chunk of the electorate. Labour got the biggest increase in its share of the vote since 1945 and 2017. That it completely upended the prior polling uh, that, that had taken place prior, prior to that. And that was, to a very significant extent, on the basis of what the manifesto said and the kind of promise it made. So I guess, uh, obviously, the process of policy development is ongoing, and there are discussions in the party about where we're going to go to, and I'll touch on some of that in a minute, but I guess we're not going to deviate too far from that. So what's the outline of, of the economic programme? The first one, and I, I think I want to sort of underline this, because there's been some not necessarily, I would say, very helpful debate, certainly on the left in Britain, about um, what Labour's doing or not doing, which sometimes gets translated into kind of all sorts of strange ideas about what we may or may not want to do with the economy. You know, if you look at our macroeconomic policy, in other words, if you look at the big headline stuff around what are we going to do on fiscal policy, and what are we going to do on monetary policy, this is quite deliberately, quite intentionally, about as boring as we can make it. Right? That is absolutely rock solid commitment on our part to do extremely conventional macroeconomics. There is nothing in here that starts to touch on some of the kind of more unconventional ideas that are not going around for a minute. It certainly has nothing to do with monetary theory. We aren't going anywhere near uh, some early talk about people's quantitative easing. These things are not going to happen. Um, if you take monetary policy in particular, John has said this himself, and we're sticking to it, that Bank of England independence is sacrosanct. There's absolutely no intention at all of changing uh, Bank of England independence. It simply isn't going to happen. There is a discussion, and I think this is a discussion that's now happening all over the place, about the Bank of England's mandate, which has been in place for over 20 years. Uh, if you take the last 10, a mandate that basically says you have interest rates, this is your primary sort of instrument for affecting the economy, and all that's happened is you've jammed them pretty much near zero for 10 years. Uh, clearly, there needs to be a discussion about what goes in the mandate, and I think that's an interesting productive discussion about how we think about what the central bank would do uh, in conditions after 2008 with unconventional monetary policy, this sort of thing. That is an ongoing discussion. Um, there are suggestions knocking around. Again, it's not said about including uh, monitoring house prices. There was a bold idea to give the Bank of England a productivity target, which certainly um, sparked up quite a bit of debate and discussion one way or the other. That is a, a, an ongoing uh, part of the discussion. But the core of it, the <coughs> idea that we'd end Bank of England independence, I think, is, is complete on start. It's not going to happen. That's the monetary side. Uh, dull, uh, uh, as they say. 
the fiscal side, we signed up very, very early on to what we call the fiscal credibility rule, drawn up um, on the back of some work with Simon Ray Lewis and Jonathan Portis to pretty eminent English macroeconomists on the basis of the 2014 paper where they tried to lay out what would be the ideal kind, what would be your optimum fiscal rule for a government. Um, the idea being here, I shall describe what it is, that we've said, and we intend to put this in law, um, that Labour will seek to eliminate deficit and current spending over a five year rolling period. In other words, every year the Chancellor will set a target for eliminating deficit and current spending, bit to spending, at the end of the five year period. Uh, we think this is a good way to both show that you are not simply running a current deficit for forevermore, um, but also gives you a degree of flexibility because it's a rolling target to deal with sort of day to day shocks and upsets and that sort of thing. The, we've also included a debt to trends GDP uh, ratio. We've said that at the end of five years, the debt to trend GDP will be lower at the start of five years. That's actually a bit tighter on, on what government can do with the deficit target. Uh, there's still a great deal of flexibility in here because obviously we've not restricted <coughs> capital spending at all. The innovative part of this, and this is directly from the work of, of Ren Lewis supporters, is inclusion of a, a zero lower bound rule, in which if the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England decides monetary policy is ineffective, we say we'll su suspend the rule and allow maximum possible freedom on fiscal spending. In other words, if you get to a situation, hopefully we don't, by 2008, you will have the capacity to use fiscal policy in terms of you, can't, you don't just have to rely on monetary policy for a day-to-day, for -day, uh, or rather for, for a sort of emergency action on the economy. Now again, this is all really quite deliberately conservative. This is quite intentionally setting out something very clear, very specific, this is what we're going to stick to, this is how we're going to try uh, and manage the economy, because we think, broadly, that the problems in the British economy are not ones that are easily solved by saying, let's spend some more money. We are going to end up spending. This is a thing. And we can do that inside our own fiscal rule. We picked it because it allows us to say we can reverse the cuts and we can undo some of the damage that's been done over the last eight years or so, or potentially 12 years by 2022. It allows us to do that. So we think the deeper issues are the structural problems in the British economy. That the problem of low investment isn't simply that the government is doing cuts. The problem of low investment is the problem of our institutions, which are too short term, which are too fixated on. on day-to-day -day profit and, and immediate short-term considerations and aren't delivering uh, the kind of economy that we want to see. So we want to start to correct those institutions. One part of that is uh, getting to the Treasury and starting to rewrite, if you like, its operating system. The Treasury here has a clear set of rules on how it makes investment decisions, how it decides what projects get funded. Codified in the Green Book. The Green Book is an extremely sort of standard documents involving cost-benefit analysis with a few other tweaks and bells and whistles uh, that they've slightly introduced over the years on perhaps you can include you know, social impact, perhaps you need to think about the long term. We don't think that goes far enough. We think if you want to correct the extraordinary bias in the British economy, and this is one of the sort of deep underlying problems we're up against, the extraordinary bias of economic activity towards London and the South East, and the extraordinary bias of government spending, particularly investment spending, uh, and the figures of this are quite something to behold. Uh, that we need to change how the institutions that sit with us in this operate. So rewriting the Treasury Screen, changing and introducing um, a wider concept of, of how you how you make uh, investment uh, decisions is, is something we want to see happen. Russell O'Donnell, former well, what was it, former management director of the Treasury, former head of the civil services, produced an interesting report recently on uh, the use of well-being measurements and wider conceptions of what the economy is and how an economy can work for people, which I think is, is of interest. Uh, you can look at what the New Zealand government has done to get its own treasury to start to think more broadly about how the economy operates, introducing well-being budgets. I think these are the areas that we we'll start looking at, getting away from a pure uh, cost-benefit analysis. And people are interested, actually, there's a paper by Diane Coyle, a co-author from the end of last year, um, which just goes into the details of how that bias happens. That in particular, once you have cost benefit analysis, you end up just looking at what's happening now and how you can adjust that. You can't do the big transformative investments that we want to do. The big transformative investment we want to do, we rather grandly labelled the National Transformation Fund. Inside the fiscal credibility, we're all given space to borrow to invest £250 billion. Pounds. So you said we'll do that over a 10 year period. The primary focus of that, although it was less of an issue in the 2017 manifesto, I think it's going to come right before this time around, will be on decarbonising the economy and on providing a, a Green New Deal in some form or another, green jobs.
jobs, three jobs across the whole country, and the economy that has significantly less um, environmental impact at the end, at least of our first term. Um, there is a discussion in the Labour Party uh, going up to conference at the minute that we have a, a commitment to a net zero carbon target in 2050. The government, as of what yesterday, now has a commitment to a net zero uh, carbon target or greenhouse gas target in 2050. There's a discussion at the minute to pull that date significantly further back. And if that happens, that's, that becomes a more uh, radical, more interventionist uh, uh, program. So we'll see where that discussion gets to. Labour for the Green New Deal is a pressure group inside the party is calling for 2030 as their date for, for a net zero of the carbon target. My guess is we'll end up somewhere between 2050 and 2030 as uh, policy at some point, given the, the way the discussions will play out. But nonetheless, that will be a change, I think, from the, the 2017 manifesto and something where, where we're moving somewhat beyond it. The other parts of this, I think, are around the, the kind of the ownership agenda, or, or what, what we're going to label the ownership agenda. Um, a couple of academics, Joe Guy and Martin O'Neill, called it Labour's institutional term, which has a, a nice sort of academic uh, turn of phrase. And this is the, the, the idea exactly of getting out of thinking that we're just here to do a sort of standard social democratic tax and spend, end austerity, make public services work. We are going to do all that. That is like the primary thing that we're going to be aiming for. But if you want an economy that works over the long term, in particular, wants an economy that works over the long term, in conditions where you have to decarbonise and deal with the effects of climate change. And one that is fairer, in addition to all of that, you have to deal with some of the big structural problems. So that's the institutional term. The document we put out before, the, just before the 2017 uh, election, is called Alternative Models of Ownership. This is the kind of outline of some of the areas we want to get into. And what's happened since 2017 is we start to flesh some of that out. The commitments to bring back into public ownership uh, the various parts of the economy that frankly should never be privatised. So railways are perhaps the most obvious, uh, the utilities, the post office, all of these brought back into public ownership, brought back into public ownership in, in newer forms. Um, the recent document from Labour, which is after, just after I've sort of gone off to write a book, uh, goes into what we'd like to do to energy systems. I think the interesting thing there is not that we're here to simply take the entire existing electricity system and bring it back into public ownership, but instead there's a need to look at uh, forms of local energy ownership, community energy ownership, Ownership. If you want to rapidly decarbonise the economy, for example, the obvious way to do this is more onshore wind. It's cheaper, cheaper than gas by this point. The objection that you run into if you want to do onshore wind is you need to build onshore wind in windy parts of the country. And people not reasonably don't want their views spoiled. I have to be rather crude, but this is how the thing starts to play out. And they don't want their views spoiled, whether it's a big private energy company doing it or whether it's a big public energy company doing it. It really doesn't make much difference. But if you can give people ownership of the wind plants, and the scale that you need to operate on here allows you to do that, then those objections start to, start to disappear. This is what happens in Denmark, what happens in Germany. Again, we're operating inside you know, kind of Northern European social democratic norm at this point, but I think it's important. That if we say that we want to change ownership, this isn't just about let's have public ownership of more things. I think that's important for, certainly for areas that should never be privatised back in the 80s and into the 90s. But it's also about wider forms of ownership, more dispersed forms of ownership local councils taking over and setting up their own renewable energy projects, which is starting to happen. Community ownership of uh, some assets locally. If you land reports produced by George Mongo and a few other people last week goes into some of the forms of local sort of collective ownership of land that we can look at. And also, I think, uh, most dramatically, uh, a rapid expansion of employee ownership, worker ownership, which we've called uh, an inclusive ownership fund, announced by John uh, last year's conference, in which we're expecting large companies companies own 250 employees to put 1% of their equity into a collectively owned trust every year, which will then be held by the workers in that company, and they'll be entitled to dividends and voting rights because of that collective ownership. So over time, you gradually convert your large companies to a form uh, of collective ownership. You give people a great stake in that company, you give people direct uh, say and control over the dividends and receive the dividends, so you have an obvious material stake in it, and we think this is going to be an important way which we start to dramatically shift how decision making happens in our large companies. That we know worker ownership, and when you have more participation in, in corporate governance from the workforce, companies tend to act in a more long term way. They think about the future a bit more. They're not just chasing what we have at the minute, which is very, very short term, uh, very, very short term profit basis that, that large companies too often run on. So we're going to shift that over time. Again, it's part of the ownership agenda. Again, this is about more than just saying we will tax and spend. We are going to do that. The 2017 manifesto had. 46 billion pounds worth of tax rises to pay 46 billion pounds worth of current spending increases. 
we'll probably end up around the same place for the next time around. That is an important part of it. It's important to be able to say it. But the big program here is structural changes, the institutional changes uh, that we want to try and do through that. But to sort of wrap up around um, Brexit, I think we'll be able to questions in a bit. Um, it, it's, it's, like, it's, one those, it's one of those things where I think everybody secretly uh, would, would prefer not to have to talk about it by, by this point in, in proceedings. So it's sort of rattled around for three years in, in its own way with all sorts of fairly baleful, baleful, baleful consequences that, that we've seen. Uh, in particular, I would say that Theresa May, in insisting on trying to drive through a deal that Parliament wasn't going to accept, has produced the most extraordinary sort of backwash, uh, political backwash. Uh, across the whole country, that their determination to try and get that initial deal through, which, by the way, from you know, from personal point of view, I think it's, it's, it should be unacceptable to anybody who thinks they're progressive or on the left. I personally don't think, personally, and I've said this publicly before, I personally don't think we should be talking about any freedom of movement in the way that, that we have done. I absolutely don't want to see a deal with the EU which prioritises the ending of free movement and sort of trashes everything else. That's roughly uh, the deal on the table at the minute. I also don't want to see a deal that includes in the outline of the political declaration, the continuation of the level playing field uh, of the European Union, state aid rules, competition rules, and the rest of it. The, the, this to me looks like a deal that no one on the left, no one on the progressive side of the spectrum, should go anywhere near. Unfortunately, Parliament has consistently rejected it. If you look at the brave talk from the various Conservative leaders, they're insisting they can get this through somehow or other. This doesn't, well, apart from Boris Johnson, uh, this doesn't look particularly likely, and I don't see any uh, reason why Labour would shift its position, its firm opposition to a deal is demonstrably not the jobs first Brexit and not the kind of delivering sort of Brexit that, that people would like to see. More widely than that, I think you, you're seeing a situation in which the discussion on Brexit has got to a point where clearly, if it comes down to saying how do we prevent no deal Brexit, ladies and very clear in respect to the results of the referendum, but if it comes down to a situation preventing a no deal Brexit, then certainly something like a, a second public vote uh, would be uh, an option to consider and something worth fighting for. If it's not possible to get a general election, then this is, this is the option that, that you end up having to look at. That would be challenging in itself, to say the least. But if we're determined to try and avoid something like a no deal Brexit, which I think you, know, you don't have to think too far about just how damaging and bad this could end up being. Uh, and you really don't. I mean, the civil service is happily trying to tell it through this at uh, this point in time. But if it comes down to stopping that, then uh, a people's vote, a second referendum. Is, is not on the table, and we could we could end up in that situation by like September, October this year. So that's the outline of the situation of Brexit. Um, there are some nuances around that which sometimes don't get discussed. I think from from a from the point of view of a future Labour government, there are specific issues around financial services and the access of financial services to European markets. Broadly, once you lose passporting, you as a financial service provider in um, passporting access to European markets. Once you're a financial services provider outside of passporting, you can be fairly indifferent about no deal or different kinds of deal. Equivalence regime is just never ever going to be as good as it's passporting access. It's quite a hit for financial services to do this. Worse than that, I think, is the possibility of weakening a uh, future government's negotiating position if we have to still negotiate deals when they have the potential to remove equivalence uh, rights at a moment's notice, so 30 days <coughs> of enhanced equivalence. In other words, you can create a form of pressure for the people you're negotiating with to remove market access to financial services. The Commission has already done this in negotiations with Switzerland, and I think it's something to, to watch out for in uh, any future situation we end up with. That is, um, that, that's my sort of introductory remarks, and I'm very happy to take uh, comments and questions. I'm, I'm really interested to hear what, what people have to say, actually. Thanks, uh, thank you.